in my heart, oh God. It's always a good policy, I think, to, you know, review what you're sharing with people so they could see and maybe run out and buy it. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I would never recommend for people to do that, ever. You know, I get these things, most of them I've always found in a used bookstore somewhere, you know, that I would go out of my way to watch for the days when you can go to a, a Memorial Day sale or some other sale on a used bookstore or used used store, and I pick up books that way. I don't bother with going to some brand new store to find Christian books or anything else for that matter. You know, I'm perfectly content with finding deals that, I don't know, I enjoy it. It's kind of a fun thing between the Lord and I. And given time and patience, I've always gotten everything I wanted. And, you know, I think when you take the time in the mornings, you know, and time at noon and even in the evening to sit down and talk to God and to have him direct your ways and lead you in the paths that you should go, he'll take you to those favorite little nooks and crannies of your life that you'll find that it's just something special between you and him that no one else knows. And I I don't know about you, but that's what makes my, my life with God so personal and real and makes Jesus so evident that he's with me that, you know, I have no doubt. I mean... People are dumbfounded by my confidence in, in the Lord, I guess, that, you know, they they tell me everything they want to. And I say, well, you know, that's fine, but, you know, I talk to Jesus. <laughs> you can tell me anything you want to, but when you know Jesus, when you know God, when you talk with God, when God talks to you, you don't worry about what other people are thinking about it or what they're doing or whether they believe you. Who cares? You can't convince a convinced man. You know, I mean, that's the whole point. When you know, you know. There's just no question about it there's no worries of apologetics or you know having any way to need to prove things to others or to yourself because you have a relationship and that relationship is precious to you and you enjoy it and you participate in it and God responds because he loves you and that's what it's all about that's what really being a Christian means knowing God and being like Jesus Christ-like. When your joy is clouded over, eh, this is a long one. We better read fast. <laughs> and I better not talk anymore. When your joy is clouded over, have things ever robbed you of your joy? Has something of temporal value ever become so important to you that your joy in the Lord does a vanishing act? Your preoccupation with that thing casts a cloud that obliterates the warmth of a concentrated devotion to your Lord. Maybe it is something tangible, or maybe it is something in your past that you cannot seem to shake. Can you say, yes, I can relate. I've been there. Yeah, that's happening to me. Well, beloved, so have I. I will never forget the time when bed sheets robbed me of my joy. <laughs> oh, really? Imagine losing your joy over something as simple and mundane as bed sheets when there is a whole world out there in desperate need of knowing our Lord and His Word. And if you men think you can't relate to this, just substitute something that has to do with your car, like tires. Years ago, when we first purchased what is now called the Precept Ministries Conference Center, we moved into an old yellow farmhouse on the property. One of the first things we did to make it home was to redecorate our bedroom with some attractive dark blue wallpaper I found on a discount rack. I was excited. The room looked so handsome now. The bed spread, curtains and rugs were all coordinated. Everything except the sheets. But there was no problem. Our one and only set of king size sheets was due for a replacement. What wonderful timing. So I went out to roam the discount stores and sale racks looking for coordinating sheets. Two sets caught my eye. One was perfect, but the matching pillowcases were sold out. Although pillowcases were available for the other set, that was my second choice because the color was a lighter shade of blue than the wallpaper. <laughs> well, wonder where we're going with this. This was to be my only set of sheets, so I wanted them to look just right. I stood there debating and debating and finally decided I'd take my chances and get the set without the pillowcases. I reasoned that, since it was a name brand, I'd be able to find the matching pillowcases elsewhere. I rushed home, put my new treasures on the bed, and stood back and looked at the effect with great satisfaction. 
As I snuggled into sleep that night, I shut out any doubts about what I would do if I didn't find pillowcases to match the sheets I was sleeping on. The next morning, I hit the stores again. And guess what? You're right. I couldn't find matching pillowcases anywhere. And we had already slept on our new sheets. Suddenly, my joy was gone. <laughs> would you believe that from that day on, sheets were all I could think of? I would try to study, I would think sheets. I'd be teaching, and all of a sudden my mind would be covered with those sheets. I'd start my quiet time, my eyes would drift over to the bed, and all I could think about was sheets. <laughs> I keep thinking three sheets to the wind, but that's sailing, never mind. And with every remembrance of sheets, I would beat myself mentally for not buying the light blue ones with matching pillowcases. A set of sheets had robbed me of my joy. Isn't that ridiculous? Yes. But I'm sure you have your own story of how something robbed you of your joy, something as small as sheets or as significant as your job. How do you handle situations like this when that can drive you up the wall and keep your focus off the things that really matter, like the joy of the Lord or our need of Christ-likeness? Well, let's look at Philippians 3 and see what we can learn and then live by the things that start to rob us of our joy. Let's begin by reading several verses from this wonderful chapter and underlying every use of the word things. Paul said, Whatsoever things were gained to me, those things I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 7 and 8, 13 and 14. And I think I'm going to stop there because, you know, in my life, early on, God asked me to give up everything, you know, and I'm not saying that that's what he's done with you. You know, I'm, I was a Jesus freak. I, I was very adamant about my life being given over to God with all that I am and all that I ever would be and all my plans and devotions and emotions and I did. Everything that ever came into my life I was just as easily giving it away and passing it back out and donating it to someone or any time that I thought I was getting too attached to something I'd share it with someone and give it to them. If they liked it I'd donate it to them. And you know there's a, a balance there of things that bind you and things that confine you, but then things that you release and you count as important. And what I found was that in my relationship with God, I wanted that more than anything else. So I was more than willing to give up all that I owned in order to gain Jesus. When Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him, at some point in time, you will have to. If you choose to follow Jesus, he's not going to let you keep all your toys. You can't be a toy bought, paid for, worldly, carnal, fleshy Christian and follow Jesus. It doesn't work. You will sit here probably on the day of the rapture and wonder why the Lord did not take you. Sorry, you may have been consumed by your possessions and thought that you were following God when you were consumed by the things that you put in front of God. At some point in time, we all have to face it. Are we owned by or owning our possessions? Are we possessed with Jesus or possessed with the world? Are we in full possession of our faculties or are we facilitated by the Holy Spirit owning our faculties? In other words, there could be chains that you are bound in and wrapped around in that you forged yourself causing you to be so confined and defined by what you own that you're unable to do anything really for God. Look around. If the Lord came to you today, could you walk away? Today, if God said to you, come, could you walk away? Oh, but Lord, I have a wife. Jesus, what if he said, come? Oh, but Lord, you know, I, I, my father just died. But if Jesus said, come? Oh, but, but Lord, you know, I have to, I got a job. What if Jesus said, come? Did you know that that's what he did to the disciples? He didn't wait until they were ready. He walked up to them in their job with Matthew and Levi, and he said, come, and he got up immediately and left. You see, there is a point in time where you must come just as you are, with all that you have or none of what you have, and you've got to give it to God. 
you've got to try, you've got to release it, you've got to let it go. Because here's what will happen. Those things that you hang on to and cling to will become poison in your soul that will bind you and wrap around you and keep you from hearing God speak. If you really want to know, and that's what this devotional, devotional, one of the last things that was about it was to hear God speak. If, if you really want to hear God speak, he may ask you to do things you don't know that you need to do. And sometimes that may be making you look pretty sad when you have to walk away from your multi-billion dollar business or your multi-million dollar car or your billion dollar home or whatever it may be, so that you could gain a personal relationship with Jesus. I hate to say it, but if something's standing in the way, God said something very simple to each and every one of us. I will have no other gods before me. And you could put that as saying, I will have no other gods between me and you. Nothing should stand in your way of having a personal relationship with God. Absolutely nothing. Because if there is anything, if there's anyone, if there's any person, if it's your children, if it's your wife, if it's your husband, if it's your church, if it's your pastor, if you're a deacon, whatever it may be, if there's anything standing between you and a personal relationship with Jesus, it will fall. The same way that the Ark of the Covenant went before the Temple of Baal, Baal, and that altar fell. Sadly, a lot of people discover late in life that they have been consumed with the wrong things. Jesus said it pretty simple. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, even these things you gave up for him, would be added unto you. I can tell you this. There ain't nothing I own that's going to stop me from sharing Jesus or being with him and spending time with him. Because I already found how easy it is to give those things away. But how great it is to gain what I have. Oh, <laughs> what I have in the Lord and you can have more than I have all you got to do is talk it over with Jesus share it with God and that Holy Spirit that's living inside you may take you in a way you've never dreamed imaginable if he could take John to heaven I'm sure you could discover God in your midst